Hello guys, in this interview, Nobel laureate Robert Schiller will discuss the stock market and bubbles in general. In this clip, you will learn 1. How bubbles are born. 2. What causes bubbles to pop? 3. Why the US stock market is the most overpriced in the world. 4. What is the Cape Ratio and what it is telling us? 5. What can we learn from market crashes? 6. What is Tina? And 7. Why there is always something to worry about in the stock market and in the economy? Enjoy this amazing interview. Don't forget to like and subscribe if you haven't done it already. What's driving it is, has been uh, a, a mystery. Uh, and uh, it certainly has something to do with changing narratives. People can see public attitudes changing. But the problem is, we haven't until recently been able to measure these narratives. or It's all kind of personal opinion. Uh, and so it's hard. Uh, and I, I have been trying to understand the narratives uh, behind this, uh, this recent stock market uh, boom. So I'll give you an example of a narrative that seems to be operative now. Uh, narratives have this form of stories, of human interest story. People love human interest. Right. They don't like to look at charts and graphs and equations. Most people don't. Uh, so it has to be presented in a way, like, like an advertisement, you know, a, 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 <laughs> a story about humans. So uh, one story that has been prominent, I think, is the story of the previous uh, financial crisis, 2007-2009, and a particular humanized version of that about the stock market, which reached its bottom in March 2009. Now, I know, because I was doing questionnaire surveys then, that people were very much afraid of a 1929 stock market crash. That was an old narrative that was coming back. Uh, and because of the reminder of the, the recent bank failures, uh, it seemed like 1929 all over again. So there was a huge spike in concern about that. And people were afraid. A lot of them were pulling their money out of the market because they feared a 1929 stock crash. Huh. And now they're regretting it because <laughs> it turned out it was a horrible time to put it. That was, March of 2009 was the perfect time to put your money into the market because the stock market essentially tripled after that. So uh, people are kicking themselves for making that mistake. So I think we, we had a, a depression scare between February 19th and March 23rd of this year. Right, of 2020. Yeah, connected with COVID-19. Maybe, you know, people got scared again. Right. And they, they started selling and they made the same mistake again. Or right. so it seemed uh, by March of uh, 2020. Uh, and the market started going up. So people started to think, I think this was the story. I regret so much that I didn't recognize the opportunity uh, after the market had fallen. This time I'm not going to make that mistake again. Uh, and uh, and so they started buying, them. and so they get it even right, uh, and that's what happened. Okay, uh, but you know, in, in in the case of of March of 2020, it did seem like the world was ending, because government was shutting down swaths of the economy, um, you know, all over the world. So there was a reason to be concerned. I talked to Wall Street people all the time and you know the stock market is considered to be a leading indicator and it looks ahead and so um, you know isn't that kind of part of the maybe the Wall Street narrative as well is that look th th this is the darkest day these are the darkest days but uh, the you know will bounce back as of March 2020 there was a lot of discussion about uh, epidemics as you well know Right. This talk turned to a, an examination of the, of the situation. Uh, for one thing that people did is look at the, 2000, at the 1918 epidemic, 
it didn't have an obvious effect on the stock market. There was no crash, uh, and uh, there was only a mild recession. But they think this doesn't look like a classical cause of a, of a depression. The, the story that the vaccine would come and, and stop the whole thing encouraged people to think that uh, I should be in the market. Right. Uh, it, was this, it was the vaccine story. So, you know, it wasn't really crazy to be in the market. Uh, you saw it trending upward. And a rational person listening to these stories doesn't know what is the truth. It's not crazy, but it, it, it's a story that influenced people because it was being told and retold. Uh, and it led you into an emotional um, swirl. Uh, I don't want to make the mistake of buying just before the top of the market. Uh, and I don't want to uh, stay out of the market and see it keep on going up. So there's no answer to what one should do. Uh, right. You can see the prominence of certain stories that were motivating for people to buy at this time. And certainly the work from home, uh, the fact that the tech stocks, the FANGs, or, you know, including Microsoft, uh, did so well because there seemed to be clear winners um, coming out of the pandemic, right? So the pandemic surge in the U.S. stock market, which made it the most highly priced market in the world, had largely to do with the boom in the uh, information technology sector and the communication services sector. Uh, and uh, U.S. is the, uh, I think, has the highest proportion in the world of, of such stocks. That's one reason why the U.S. stock market is the most overpriced in the world. Ah, that's interesting. You use the word overpriced. I use so, the word overpriced. Uh, that's, that is a narrative, by the way. Uh -huh. I'm asking people about uh, whether the market is overpriced or underpriced, uh, and whether you're afraid of a crash. I've been asking that since uh, the late 1990s. So we're, we're torn between those, uh, the, the idea that the stock market is trending upward, and maybe for good reason. There's the stay at home, uh, the working at home uh, mantra that's going around. Right. Maybe this is a fundamental change in the economy that we'll, we'll learn from what we're doing and everything will be wonderful. Uh, I give some credence to that view. <laughs> I, you know, I can't say that any narrative is totally wrong. Mm -hmm. It's a question of how much they're emphasized in talk and in, in, the, in the news media. So, Bob, it's always a mistake to use a word like overvalued with a uh, reporter. I, know, yeah. <laughs> I think you realize that. So, so let me ask you about, about that observation. How does the U.S. stock market's value look in terms of the CAPE ratio? And that, of course, is the cyclically adjusted price-to-earnings ratio. How does it look? The CAPE ratio is, at this point of time, at, at, at one of its highest levels. In fact, for the United States, uh -huh. uh, for the United States, the only times when there was a higher CAPE ratio was uh, just before the 1929 crash and also just before the 2000 uh, dot-com bubble burst. Uh, so it's very high. However, uh, I've been pointing out, as of others, that uh, there's also a very high bond market, bond yields are very low. Right. And so the idea of putting your money out of the stock market and putting it into the bond market is not uh, so appealing, not the long-term bond market. Uh, because it, yields to maturity there are, are, for the 10-year treasury are under 1% now. Right. Uh, so the excess return that we predict between U.S. stocks and U.S. 10 years uh, treasuries uh, is something like 4%. The stock market has been an amazing performer uh, for over 100 years, uh -huh. with the exception of 1929. Right. Uh, that's an interesting story. Uh, but the overall, it's been doing very well. It's more like 10% a year, real. Uh, so it's not as good as it seemed before. Uh -huh. uh, but, but compared to the alternative, it's good, right? The stock market right. compared it's riskier, to... riskier, but it's good, yeah. Right. So so I think so it has a place in one's portfolio. Yeah. I might add that other countries have lower CAPE ratios. The U.S. is the highest. 
uh, and so if you uh, want to consider the stock market investing in general, it looks even better if you diversify across nations. If you go to individual countries, uh, you can look at Russia as having just about the lowest CAPE ratio. <laughs> Uh, a lot of people don't want to invest in Russia for various mistrusts that they have of the Russian government. Right. Um, but it might be a good idea as part of one's portfolio. Uh, when, their, when their CAPE ratio is under 10 and ours is over 30, it's quite a difference. Mm -hmm. Depending on um, how speculative you want to get. I look at the Wall Street narratives a lot, and certainly there has been a narrative around for a long time called TINA. There is no alternative compared to the bond equivalent, which is what most people usually consider as investors. Do I invest in the bond market or the stock market? The bond market it, it is not an alternative because it's so expensive and yields are so low. Sometimes narratives are true and sometimes they're not. What is the vil validity, do you think, from an investment point of view of, of TINA? Uh, I, I, I think it's not all or nothing. You, you know that the return on the stock market is, we're not predicting it to be as high as it has historically. And it's still risky. I think it's uh, in a risky phase. Mm -hmm. but I think it's entirely reasonable to have shares in the uh, U.S. Uh, stock market and even in technology, which is uh, highly priced. Uh, information technology is a uh, something that we can be patriotic about. The U.S. is a big success in this field. And the, the living at home experience is reminding us that things don't have to be done the way they've always been done. Uh, so that can cut the, either way, it can encourage you to think that technology is a great stock uh, investment, or it can make you afraid of losing your job, possibly to a robot or uh, these things are still on our mind. They're long ago narratives that haven't disappeared completely. Right, and as a matter of fact, that that's a narrative that you covered. I mean, really, fa you know, in a fascinating way, uh, in your your book, Narrative Economics. <laughs> they had machine replacing jobs uh, in ancient times. Uh huh. Uh, but it never seemed that provocative uh, until uh, the 19th and 20th centuries, uh, and now it's getting scarier. Uh, it might get scarier uh, if uh, people realize that, for example, my job is a taxi driver. That looks like it's, uh, it's a fallback job that many people take. But uh, we're getting driverless cars now, and people are working from home now, so we don't need so many of those. So people are saying, well, what's left for me? And that, that is a, a, a worry that uh, I think uh, might eventually drive the market down. Uh, at this point, I'm still in the market. I still think people should have some exposure to the U.S. market. There are narratives out there that, that are scary and that could bring the market down and uh, the economy down. Bob, are there ever times when there aren't scary narratives? Uh, well, the narratives never go, completely go away. No. And uh, there are times. So I'll tell you a time when uh, scary narratives were not prominent. Uh, New Year's Eve. 2000. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, up until that time, we had seen a whole, uh, the news media was filled with stories about the internet and how it would change our lives, and about advanced technology. And scary narratives were still around; they just weren't in uh, prominence then. Thank you, guys, for watching. I hope you enjoyed. Don't forget to hit the like button and to subscribe if you haven't done it already.